with all the big calls on all the big races. It's time for another Water Shout coming to you on Friday evening. Myself, Dave Orton, what a week it has been. All you viewers last week, let's hope you enjoyed our massive guest, Nikki Henderson. What an interview that's proved to be throughout the week. On the first day, two winners, two seconds. Mr. Coffee went close, didn't he? Mill Green ran a stormer as well. Great stuff from Nicky. We'll be having him back on, hopefully, later in the year. All right, let us know how you're getting on out there. Get your questions below. If you want to have a chat, of course, like and subscribe on YouTube. Subscribe has gone through the roof this week. Of course, anything on Facebook, let's have it. And Twitter, hashtag what a shout. Thrilled to be joined by the better getter to himself, Keith Melrose. A little bit of time since he's done a what a shout. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, might be the steer last year, actually. It, oh, and oh, he's already got it in. Matt Gardner's back with us as well. Here to prune the form. I've been working on that line. <laughs> <laughs> it, I'll, Matt, if you don't know, you came and joined us at Dublin Festival, didn't you, yeah. when Gordon Elliott was on. It was really good. Um, another good show. And uh, you're one of our handicappers, so you're going to sort of Talk to, tell us about the figures. Yeah, plenty of stuff to get stuck into this week. Obviously, some massive figures from some impressive horses. So, uh, yeah. How's your yeah. week gone? Oh, it could have been better, but that's always the case, isn't it? Oh, right? yeah, so, very much. Uh, so the Wednesday yeah. deluge was just, I mean, yeah. what a curveball for everyone. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we were saying on the Wednesday, you couldn't believe that was the same track as Tuesday. Of <laughs> you know, course, record went by a second on Tuesday, yeah. and then Wednesday, you couldn't see anything through the mud. Yeah, the dust will have settled by the time everyone's watching this on the Gold Cup, where it might well be good ground we're doing in the morning. It's just an amazing place. And let's go to Cheltenham, shall we? Not the track, but probably a hotel somewhere, because from our Spencer's, Bet365, where is Pat Cooney? So I'm at uh, Cheltenham, about five miles from the track, and it's a gorgeous sunny day here at the moment. Wednesday seems like a lifetime ago in all that deluge. Yeah, we'll be hearing from you, Pat, exactly how the week's gone. Great that you're making an appearance for going in the, it, before going and enjoying Gold Cup <laughs> Day as well. Right, let's have a look what's coming up for you. Slightly more compact show, but we will be featuring some big races for you. Keith's in, so only over fences we go. It is the Midlands National, however. The puzzle is there to be solved. <coughs> and, of course, we'll be looking back through the highlights of the week, Matt will be giving us exactly the line on some of the big performances before the all-important weekend naps. All right, we're having fun in the studio. Why not? It's the end of the best week in the world, isn't it? And what a festival it has been. I mean, we should talk about it a little bit. The Tuesday, what a feel-good factor. You were probably at home at that point when you came down to the studio where you are right now. Oh, yeah, Tuesday was the one day I watched from home. And, yeah, I mean, the week... <laughs> if you're being very glass half empty about it, the week could only go down from the very first well, race. Well, yes, it? yeah. I don't, I don't think, I don't think I'll, I've ever seen anything quite like that. Well, we're talking about Constitution Hill, of course, in the Supreme, the Supreme for the ages. Poor Dysart Dynamo got no further than the second last, having been harried throughout with John Bond. Matt, let's open the floor to you then. We were saying in the studio that afternoon. I, Rodway, with me, your assistant, Benning, editor, and I said he's not going to let it go one seventy, you know. And I said, but he ought to. And then Robbo went, oh, no, 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 Mel Rose will never do that. He'll put, he pours cold water on these things. Lo and behold, we have what I've ever seen. Is this, is this the biggest ever figure? It, yeah, it, so he's replaced Altior, who was, he was 166, uh, previous highest rated winner of, of this race. Um, I think it's the best of any festival novice. Um, wow. Just, just supremely impressive. You know, John Bonn and, and Dysart Dynamo, to me, look proper novices coming into this. I was a big Dysart Dynamo fan. Um, he's just blown him away and you know you look at he had the ideal conditions to run to a big figure big figure strong pace decent yeah. ground but he sort of went above and beyond that 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 strength of finish in the straight was just unbelievable the um, biggest ever novice hurdle figure it will be because um, well he's the biggest even on time form scale even going longer than us and they'd beat Golden Signet who was the 70s late 70s yep. uh, so you know we've only RPRs have only been going since mid to late 80s uh, so it makes sense that he's the highest novice, novice hurdle figure there's ever been on our What field. a start for this show as well then. So, <laughs> uh, okay, before we go to Pat, um, chasing <coughs> next year, hurdling next year, opinions? Whatever he damn well likes. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> both. Yeah, yeah, could, yeah just why not, why not turn up? You, there's enough time between the champion hurdle and Gold Cup, isn't there? <laughs> uh, are they allowed to doubly enter anymore? I don't know, well, mate. We should make a case for yeah. that. But champion hurdle obviously looks the one, doesn't it? Yeah, we're all looking forward hopefully to him. Hope was not bluffing and he's going to go to punch us down and face Honeysuckle. We were uh, talking about what price he should be off here. I yeah. think two's on. Before we get to the great mayor, Pat, what was it like when he went in? Did you take a stinging? Well, it was actually a decent looking book in the race, uh, uh, all things considered. But, you know, I, I was trying to be a miserable so-and-so after the race and try and find flaws with the performance. 
And Mighty Potter was well packed each way, 7 1. He pulled up. Dysart Dynamo, did he really run his race when he fell? And John Bond lost a shoe. I don't know when he lost it. Um, but that being said, you can you can say all that, but in the end, you just go, wow, that was unbelievable. And um, what a start. And it sets it up. Would they go to Punchestown? As the guys are saying, it would be amazing if they did. And, um, you know, after the race, I spoke to, after, after the day, I spoke to about eight or ten different people, all judges I respect, jockeys and trainers. And I said to them, okay, here we are at Punchestown, Constitution Hill taking on Honeysuckle. Who are you with? And I tell you what, 80 percent of them went for a honeysuckle. And I said, well, we wouldn't be pricing it that way. Seeing is believing. Everyone will want to be with the uh, with Constitution. But I, they were saying that honeysuckle, she just dosses a bit in front. She's the uh, she's unbeaten. She'll beat them at Punchestown. I'm not so sure myself. I think the betting public will make uh, Nikki Henderson's horse favourite. Well, 15 from 15 in the champion she became. Matt has come to you on this. Uh, comparatively, looking at the times, one of the slower ones, wasn't it, on the day? I mean, obviously, Constitution smashed the track record, didn't he? Yeah, and, you know, Honeysuckle, she's 159 performance figure for winning the race, some mm. way below last season. Mm. Well, that's, it's 166 if she's a gelding, you know, because of the beer's sure. 7 pound allowance. Sure. Yeah. That would, even 166 would be a below average champion hurdle? Just about on, just about, yeah. Okay. I think I think the thing with her is that 159, is kind of around where she's been at this season. Yeah. Um, I've not been that impressed with this season. I wasn't that impressed with her on Tuesday, to be honest. Um, I, I don't know. Let me, let me get on the honeysuckle vibe here because, I mean, look, she's 15 for 15. She's, she, I mean, people talk about Dawn Run. I wasn't lucky enough to you know, remember seeing her live, but this is definitely the best mare I've ever seen. She's going to get the £7 off him. No, she's not, Annie Poe would have beat her. Oh, come on, man. Annie Poe was yeah. a better horse. You're not. Yeah, the figures so, yeah. suggest you're racing by numbers. Look at the two of you. I'm being ganged up on it. <laughs> I mean, Honeysuckle is what... what when I see... I've said in the past to try and get a reaction. Honeysuckle is basically brief income with the mirrors on it. You're channeling G-Rod. Well, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, but, that wasn't... That's not particularly damnation. You know, he was a very good horse yeah. and he was also extremely consistent and he was really tough. And yeah. we talk now in, in rosy terms about the Hardy Eustace Brave Inca days because there were Hardy so and so's those things. And, uh, and Honeysuckle is exactly the same. You cannot knock her consistency. But I'm saying if you get me a proper champion of champions, they will yeah. beat Honeysuckle because of her level. Okay, but she beat, look, she beat Epitant, didn't she? Who was, I think, back to her best. And again, is it, how much, I mean, look, you shouldn't really be fans or not fans of horses, should you, Matt? And you're kind of grimacing no. a bit there. And, the, the, had she so, not hit the last, she'd have been yeah, a couple of lines closer. Yeah, she'd have been, point. yeah. Uh, the, the, thing with, the thing with Honeysuckle, I think, is, you know, good horses need good horses to run to big figures. And Epitant, I know she was a champion hurdle winner, but other than that, she hasn't really beaten a top notcher, has she? And I, I, I think... Constitution Hill is that horse, and yeah, she'll get a seven pound, and he might draw a bigger figure out of her, but I, I, I think she'll fall short against a horse yeah, like that. Uh, what I will mention here, just to, Matt won't have thanked me for this. Do you know what, what's 172 minus seven? Well, correct. <laughs> I was thinking that. I was like, I was like, I was like, we're looking at a dead eat here, aren't we? So anyway, but look, that was that was pretty special. And again, this is why you're tuning into this show because you know, it's a little bit like cold turkey, isn't it? The Friday night, Saturday morning. Oh, it's all over. Well, look, we're going to talk about this. Listen, the talk about the 2023 festival starts now, right? Yeah, it's actually mm. sometimes it can be. What I tend to do is I tend to have a couple of bets for the next year's festival now. Then sort of forget about it. Well, in Monday's until... edition, you'll be doing that, won't you? Putting up some. Yeah, thanks for yeah. reminding me of that. Ah, no worries. <laughs> last, last year's selection from you was Brave Man's Game at 25s for the Brown Advisory. Oh, ouch. Yeah, ouch. ouch we'll indeed. get to him a little bit later <laughs> on. Uh, I know you've not asked me this year, by the way. I, don't, I think it's gone, gone badly over the last couple of days. Um, <laughs> let's talk about other notable performances. Edward Stone. Can we start with him? He'd run to the same 164, hadn't yeah. he, throughout his like, was it his last three or four starts? And I thought, well, it only takes. Blue Lord to maybe improve a bit to go past him. Blue Lord travelled, didn't he, and then didn't quite get up the hill. But again, a real feel-good winner, an eight-year-old winning first in sizing Europe. What do the figures say? Yeah, small small improvement, 165 we've got. Um, he'd run to a really high level before, and I think some proper campaigning as well, you know, no shirking the issue throughout the season. It, I don't think it was a strong arc, or, you know, the Irish challenge was maybe a little bit weaker than normal. That's something to remember, isn't it? after these feel-good performances. You know, we see it on the flat, don't we, when uh, Snowfall won the Oaks. You had to remember it was probably the worst Oaks you'd ever seen. Well, but was, I don't know. Yeah. It wasn't a dreadful arc all, because, look, Blue Lord would have finished yeah. second in the Supreme when he stood up last year, and Rivier did tell us a good mare, etc. Uh, and the kid, how did Gavin Echo? That was a great supplement, that, wasn't it? He's yes, got a future, was, hasn't yeah. he? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, it was it's an arc that 
there was a lot of horses in that high 150s log jam, which that's not been the level to win the Arkle for about 10 years. Yeah. You know, so it wasn't wasn't the strongest arc you'll ever see. Edward Stone, not too dissimilar to Honeysuckle in that some of his the big advantage he's got is he's a very good horse that always runs well. Mm. Yeah. And we we're talking about the time when Neely got brought down by Brave Shaska early on. There was a bit of nimbleness there. Oh yeah, it was nice. And Matt made a point that I had it. Well, <laughs> I'll make a point for him, but he said it, so he gets the credit. He just went straight back to pinging him. Yeah. There was no element of being spooked by that at all. This is not the Edward Stone as a hurdler, is it? This is a man, a boy to a man. I would suggest that the experience he got over hurdles, he was a very likeable and very solid hurdler. He's no different over fences apart from he's 10 pounds better. In the Brown Advisory, the, when I got into racing in the early 2000s, Pat might echo this as well, you didn't often look for the best hurdler, but in the Arkle you always did. I don't know, things are turning mm. my head a little bit. It shows it could be done. But, uh, of course, well, the quotes were around about 16s, weren't there, uh, for next year's champion chase Red was done. Of course, it would be nine. That's okay. Uh, but we were thinking that we were coming up against Shishkin and Ergamine. Was Shishkin bowing out? Was there pressure on that price? Yeah, we're now eight to one, Edward Stone, and he's just a very likable, rock solid horse, isn't he? Of course, uh, at the start of the season, we would have all made Fernie Hollow our favourite to win that race, and Fernie Hollow maybe he'll bounce back. But you look at the market, and Ergamine's favourite, Shiskin second, Edward Stone third in. So um, he, he's very much a player. I think we have to throw all these stats and uh, hoodoos out the windows and say, look, he's an eight year old handicap hurdler. He's just a rock-solid, high-class novice chaser, so uh, he's in good hands. And as the guys are saying, they, they, you know, they turn up and they win races with him. They don't put him away, so he's getting valuable experience all along and showed great athleticism to win there on Cheltenham. Yeah, quite. Uh, one more performance I want to talk about, if you don't mind. <laughs> We've had a little bit of chat about this uh, on, the, on the Thursday. Korak Rambler. Everyone lauding Derek Fox, apart from one person in the office. Yeah, I, I'm of the view, I mean, the horse does not make it easy for Derek Fox, but uh, Derek Fox has never seen a hold-up ride he didn't like. So he's quite happy. <laughs> one for Arthur, etc. He's quite happy to do that, and I thought, I felt he indulged the horse a little bit, and I feel if he hadn't had 20 pounds, that is a real monster, that horse. Yeah. And if he hadn't had as much, he had, you know, he had a lot in hand there. If Corrick Gramber was the best horse in that race by a pound, I'm not sure Fox would have got there. Yeah, we've seen others handicap chases, haven't we, Matt? But he must have had a great deal in hand. I guess the unseated Ascot masked that a little bit when he was coming in. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought he'd have won that Ascot race, to be honest. It was it was, it was was far enough out to have a little bit of doubt, but I, I think he'd have won that. I mean, the, with that horse going into the race, the two things I was worried about were you get too far back and he won't jump well enough. Yeah. And he did both of those and kind you don't of want it, to be doing that anyway. in, in staying chases at the moment, do you? No, so. and, and he did it anyway. So, you know, it was lovely to see him come through horses. And wasn't it? We swam through them, but yeah. what we saw with that race and how it contrasted with the two handicap chases or handicap chases on Wednesday, Thursday, I think it's a really important lesson to learn about Cheltenham. Yeah. On good okay. ground, the tactical element is a lot more fair. Had the rain come before the Ultima, Corrick Randall would not have won that race. Couldn't have got involved. Couldn't have got involved Wouldn't because have, that's what it is. Fine. Just back what jumps the first in front in these soft ground yeah. handicap chases yeah, yeah. at Cheltenham. Oh, well, that's again, it, it, it's an in-running paradise, isn't it? Uh, national Vim, we're thinking next year potentially just looks like one for Arthur, doesn't it? Or is he better than that? Maybe more talented. Potentially. Um, I would, you know, what I would say, there's a precedent here with this stable. We've got one for Arthur had that season where every time he made the track, he improved a stone when I thought, what's more has this horse got to find? Mighty Thunder last year was very, very similar. Yeah. And the following season, both one for Arthur and Mighty Thunder have barely been able to raise a gallop. Yeah, mm. okay. So we need to watch out for oh. that. But I think they'll be Scottish national now, won't they? Oh, well, that's interesting. Of course, that's coming up before on. He certainly is he's five to one clear favourite with a few amount of firms that have priced him up. Yeah, that's very interesting. Pat, is that the case with you? And what about next year's national? Well, well, I did say to Lucinda after the race, run him in the Bet365 chase at Sandown, three <laughs> miles five. And she said, oh, he'll get an entry in that, don't you worry. But uh, you'd like to think uh, Scotland would be next on his agenda. I did think it was quite heartwarming, really. The English horses were the first five places in the race. And I think that rocked a few people on their heels a little bit, looking at the handicaps later on on the card. But uh, maybe that was a full storm. Yeah, he's a very, very good horse, isn't he? He does a lot wrong in his races. I was beginning to think, will they put headgear on him at some stage? But uh, yeah, he got a masterful ride. But um, yeah, l l I hope he turns up at Sandown and they skip the Scottish National. But that's just being uh, selfish. <laughs> we all know that everyone's <laughs> avoiding Kitty's light in that pack from Mr. Williams. Oh, so first five home were, were English. <laughs> oh, no, listen. <laughs> We've got oh, Scott. Our, our, our power was fish as well. That's Sam Thomas. We've not even <laughs> gone into English. the Presbury <laughs> Cup yet. 60% we? right, Pat. <laughs> listen, you, you've, you've already infuriated him, Pat. So top marks, well done. Happy days. Listen, that's day one done. Let's get a brace preview because I know a few of you will be having a few tinnies or maybe waking up with a sore head and thinking, I want to bet.
Well, after the rain comes sun, if you're in the Midlands, because it is Utoxeter's big day on Saturday, the Midlands National Day. Let's start off with the 225 then. Pat, give us the market update. Some young progressive chasers that have skipped Cheltenham for this target. Yeah, it's tough to nominate what will actually go off favourite at the moment. Fuji Flight is just about favourite at the moment from San Palais of uh, Richard Bandy. And then it's four bar, but there's only seven runners and the outsider is eight to one. So it's that kind of a race. I, what I would say about all these Saturday races that we've priced up on Monday, we, we certainly didn't give them the, this is a big uh, set of races coming up this weekend. They've, uh, they've been priced up relatively quickly because we've had other things on our agenda, of course. So there's a lot of life in this market yet. Um, Fuji flight. I will say uh, another thing. Uh, Phoenicia Williams and, and um, Lucy Turner had a winner at Cheltenham on uh, Thursday, and that was actually a well-backed horse at the, at the big prices at 40 to 1. So I would imagine Fuji flight with Venetia Williams, that will be favourite. And bear in mind, she was worried about how well the yard were uh, coming into Cheltenham. Well, that's off the, uh, off, the, off the radar now. So I think Fuji flight appeals to me, progressive. Lucy Turner claiming seven. But it is a deep old race. When the rag is only 8 to 1, you know it's tough. Right. That's okay. An incredible form from Anisha at Cheltenham this week. Oh, <laughs> remarkable. Imagine, I tell you what, I wish I could have gone up to her after the article when Brave Shaska fell at the third and says, Don't worry, Venetia, that's as bad as it gets for you. This week. <laughs> well, <laughs> we'll get to the Wednesday when it seemed like a you know a Cheltenham in January, which is when Venetia, she might not like us well, saying yes. it, perfect for her horses. But uh, let's have a look at this way. Some right old characters in this, aren't they? Because Starvian, I am waiting for him to finally put his head down and do it. Course winner. You see. Right, old characters in the rest because Stavian's the only one. A lot of interesting young. Yeah, he's, he's a bit of a funny yeah, old right. sod, but the yeah. rest of them are uh, generally can, fine. Uh, there's a lot of ones in there. Okay, I get that, but this is one of the best form lines of the spring. I, always, I was saying it just before we did this. You know, we had Asmieli won it last year. Phlegmatic was fourth. Sam's Adventure won it the year before that, before winning the Eider and yeah. Tommy Whistle the following yeah. American. season. American, American won it. That's he the one I, he yeah. always found that he'd have a lot more joy these days because his mark never came down fast enough when he was racing. Uh, and <laughs> Derasher Counter won this race as well before yeah. he won the Ladbroke. So we're going to see a handicapping star emerge on top who is it basically yeah uh, the horse I think is the most likely winner and a horse that I expect might well, no he won't because Saint Fuji Flight might end up being quite well back because of Venetia's week and but I thought Turner, yeah. if I was pricing this race up I'd have put in Sam Palais as favourite mm. because he's Richard just been Bandy. yeah he's been so progressive this season is whether we put his, it's the Mandarin chase in December look at that form Jericho Rock second and I think they were miles clear from Nestor Park who then won over the same course and distance uh, a couple of a couple of weeks later not a couple of weeks later but about a month later really strong form that Mandarin for me uh, the next time he ran in a Hoy Seniors Towton at Weatherby, yep. totally excused that. They ran the last, from about three out, they finished at two seconds a furlong quicker. And from and he memory, he was still going quite nicely going into home straight and he whacked one, didn't he? Two in a yeah, row. two, okay. So when, you can imagine in a race where they've doddle, 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 sprint. Noble Yates is in that as well, wasn't he? Finished so, yeah. he finished yeah. second. He was running to get qualified oh, for that. At 100%. Long. Um, but what simply came in there, and it, when they start quickening, and then you go bang, bang, you're dead, you're finished. So, so he... he Completely forgive yeah. that run. I think he might be the likeliest winner of this race. It's a lovely track, isn't it, for chasers? Because they just spring off that bend and they, it's just nice straight, isn't it? Long straight, for four yeah. fences to jump. So, you know, you're not getting you're not getting away with, yeah. with it, but you have how long... It's not like Exeter where it's four in the straight and it's two far long. And even if the you. Lilos and Sombreros are out, you know there's going to be cut underfoot on this day, don't you? <laughs> <It's> <laughs> always is. Yeah, it's so strange, isn't it? We have Cheltenham and it's off <clears> a good spring ground, first yeah. proper spring ground meeting. Yeah. And you come to this race and it's... it's Well, the Welsh National is the best trial. Well, uh, th there we are. Now, Matt, you're seeing the ball big in this. Yeah, I, I, I like Young Bull. Um, I, I completely get the point about Sam Pillay. Um, really progressive prior to the last run. He made a couple of mistakes, didn't he? And that was just kind of Absolutely. the end for him, you know? Um, but I think if you're interested in him, Young, young Bull, in a way, his form ties in. Um, he's got some really strong form going back to sort of 2019, 2020. He missed two and a bit years. Came back at Newbury. Um, ties in with Nesta Park, who won that race. Um, mm -hmm. The third, yes indeed. Sorry, the second, yes indeed. I think is is chucked in off his marker one three seven if he gets the right sort of race. And young Bull was bang there until two out, and then the absence told. He made a, a little mistake and he just got a bit tired. But <clears throat> the concern, I suppose, with him is that we're a month and a bit on from that. After that long absence, that might be a little bit of a worry. Um, yeah, but would this I, not be a target though? Potentially, this sort of race, it probably would be. Potentially, but it's also yeah. it might just be something to get him ready for. 
you know, maybe you're running that uh, three mile race at Ayr on Scottish National Day, the novice yes. handicap race. He could just be a final spin to get him really hard for a spring target. I, he's outside of the field here, and I would row in behind Matt to an extent. I'll be backing him as a saver because it's not it's not expensive to find out yeah. with him being the price he is. I would be amazed if he actually ends up the outsider. That was a really promising comeback at, at Newbury, and also the, he had form here. We talk about this being one of the strongest novice handicap chases. There's one here early in the season in October. Uh, that tends to work out really well. He was second in it, or third in it, sorry, behind De Machine and Morning Vicar. That worked out extremely an ex well. An extremely good yeah. bit of form. Check it out, it was fifth. You know, we've got a lot of, a lot of yeah. progressive horses came from that race. Okay. This horse has always wanted a proper test, yeah. I thought. He wants, yeah. he wants at least three miles. All right. So, yeah, he's, I, I, would be, I would not be at, at all surprised if he ran a big race. Mm, all right, a young progressive chaser will come out on top. Are you with Young Bull? I'm giving Gustavian another chance. Just one more. Right, let's go back to the Wednesday of Cheltenham, known as Champion Chase Day. But let's start with the Ballymore. Will he, won't he? The money came for Sir Gerhardt. How will he do? They changed tactics. He jumped a lot better. And he basically repeated his leopards down for beating Three Strike Life. Yeah, a small amount of improvement. Well, bigger, bit, a bigger bit of improvement for Three Strike Life. Um, yeah, it jumps a lot better. I thought that was the key to it. That was the, the sort of niggle going in, I suppose, wasn't it? Um, one five four for Sir Gerhard. Um, he kind of set a clear standard, really, and he, he didn't need to do much more than he'd already done. Um, probably not the strongest of races, but he's obviously an exciting horse and, and potentially a really good chaser next season. Well, that's the question with him, isn't it? Uh, he's he's going to be eight next year, so what do they do? Is he a bit of an appreciator? I don't well, know. Let's hope just, he sees more action than that chap. But. He avoids... I think what Mullins would do is he'd just avoid Constitution Hill, wouldn't he? Yeah. He, would just, well, he, yeah. he, he managed to do that on Tuesday. So. Well, like, well, that was it. Somebody said after the race when he won it, he said, oh, decision vindicated. No, your decision was vindicated 24 hours ago. Yeah, we're not well, quite right. But it, uh, <laughs> for the punters, Pat, that was a proper eye-eye moment, wasn't it? Because he was extremely well-backed on a horrible weather day and they knew turning into the home straight. Yeah, so he kicked off every multi, didn't he? And uh, I think as from the bookmaking side of it, we just penciled him in as well. I suppose he'll win, won't he? And Unless he doesn't jump very well, but... Uh, it all went smoothly for him. It was a straightforward run. Um, but where does he go? I don't know. As you touched on, he's going to be eight next season. Um, you'd imagine he'd probably go fencing. But these Willie Mullins horses, they get entered in everything, including the boat race, don't they? So uh, he's, a, he's a hard one to back anti-post, that's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all right, OK. So after that, uh, the, I mean, the shock and horror, which started a bit of a precedent for the next two days, was Nichols pulling out Brave Man's game. Yeah, lot said about the water, and we won't go into that. There's too much has been said. It, it, ultimately, um, when Chris Cook came on to us and said, "Look, guys, you know, Dan Skelton just spoke to him. The amount of rain that's fallen, anyway, it would have been inconsequential." Whether it's right, did Dan Skelton see that? He did. I'm glad he did because that was basically my opinion. Had it a, had it was inconsequential come race two. Ultimately, wasn't. I mean, I think I, I think the decision to water was taken out of abundance of caution and possibly wasn't the right decision, but it was moot. Well, it's because one of those, isn't it? Yeah. Who'd be a clerk of the course, right? But who would be in the camp for Long Press A and the Brown Advisory three months ago? Hardly anyone, right? And it was a, it was one of the curveball decisions of all the previews. We saw it was going to happen. He was well backed in. He ended up going off favourite, despite the fact that Heaven's Open, two fabs won the first race. And how impressive was he, Matt Gardner? Yeah, I liked him a lot. Um, again, slightly below par Irish challenge, I thought. But the winner, bang up to standard for the race, one six seven. Um, I, I was unbelievably impressed with how well he jumped. Just so good all the way around. Um, and how strong he was at the line. You're thinking maybe three and a quarter miles Gold Cup next year. He's not going to When he went to Sandown, there's a lot of talk about him going the other way. And he, yeah. it, it, he just, whatever track he's on, he goes the other way. He's a bit <laughs> of a freak like that, isn't he's he? A bit, he's a very slick jumper, isn't he? He's, yeah, he's, he's, he's a beautiful yeah. horse. Mm. If they hadn't run him over hurdles last year when they got him from France under a penalty, he'd be unbeaten for them. Uh, Pat, let's come to you then quickly. What price for the Gold Cup straight after? Well, he was around about 12 to 1. It was an impressive performance, wasn't it? Um, and the hoist, and you're... A few old timers in the crowd were likening him to Carville Silver a few years ago in massive engine, but a bit dodgy jumper. If they can straighten his jumping out, then he's very much in the equation for the Gold Cup next year as well. But I was pleased for Charlie Deutsch, friend of the show, isn't he? He's just a likable fella. And the two of them look absolutely made for each other. They just get a great tune out of each other. And he was terrific to watch. So, uh, yeah, onwards and upwards for him. No, I totally second that. It was great for Charlie. He's come back from <clears> rock bottom, hasn't he? And, you know, if you're out there and you're low, just... 
Look at what Charlie's done. He's got his head down and he smiles now with it. It's all come his way. And that celebration was probably my best of the week, I think, because you get to see these guys on these shows. You talk to them and it's, this is the culmination, isn't it? The Olympics. Sorry, I well, said it. But. It matters to him more than because his first grade one was the Silly Isles. Correct. That Long Press won. Yeah. And now to get the Cheltenham win, you know, you've got a real runner in next year's Gold Cup. And yeah. I, I, like Matt, I was really impressed with how well he went through the line. Said to me, you'll have no trouble getting the Gold Cup next year. He won't. He won't. No, really. he looked, he looked no. really, yeah. He they didn't look, mind the tactics was just like from the off you were like oh okay he's always been a stay there the only sort of danger moment was when he went to the right of a hoy senor because a hoy senor mm. jumps right yeah yeah and he long press has tended to jump yeah, left sh should we just get in your theory about <coughs> hoy senor just yeah, quickly do it i've gone cool on it the last 24 hours because of yeah but i thought he doesn't jump well enough but he's got this massive engine if you weren't so absolutely wedded to the idea of having a gold cup horse you would definitely consider the stairs wouldn't you <laughs> Ah, I hope you're listening. Another friend of the show, Scoo and Lucinda Russell out there. Uh, okay. Because the point was made, I mean, he's still learning. Yes, he's only had a few runs over fences. But yeah. when a horse keeps making the same mistakes, mm. you wonder if it's bedded in. And also this horse, when on Wednesday, when every time the pace lifted, he belted the next fence. And yet, he, and yet he's run on stoutly to look like he's got a chance oh, coming to the last, hasn't he? He's proper some horse. Engine. What yeah, a yeah. horse he is. Great for British pointing as well. Won't be the first horse we're talking about in our review going back to hurdles, leave the Thursday for a little bit. Uh, and again, British pointing seen at its best when Anergamine wins the anti-climax of the decade. <laughs> we all know what happened. Uh, we'll come to Pat for the reactions and the track and the, what the money's meant and all that sort of stuff. Shishkin just didn't want to know. A lot of paddock judges were saying, apparently at the time there was a late drift and it wasn't there and he came for an ergamine. Tony Bloom had a whopper, his, his owner on him, we know that, which he lost at Ascot, so Tony, happy days back in the game. And he just didn't look like himself. We won't talk much about that. Shaq and unseated as well. And what do you do as a handicapper then? Yeah, I mean, you've got to work with the evidence that you got. Funambula Silva was second. Small amount of improvement for him to 166. It gives you 177 and the winner, which is a couple of pounds below his previous best figure and, and sort of makes sense on the rest as well. So a real shame that it didn't pan out the way that we'd have liked. But, you know, the winner... The end of the day, he's a really good horse, isn't he? Well, unless <laughs> you know. you're back to Nergamine, of course, which you, I imagine you did. You were in his camp at Ascot. Well, uh, we were sat here when I backed to Nergamine because we were we did another show, uh, the live show, yep. that day. And after the cross the line, he was 137 to two, and I thought he's not that priced to reverse the form. There wasn't much in it. <laughs> should but we uh, should I we was... talk about the elephant in the room with this with Shishkin? Should we just have a quick word on it? We have to hope that other trainers, not just Nicky Anderson, it's got to be said that won't look at that Ascot race and think I'm going to be softened up. Yeah, I was. Big one again, you know. Henderson's immediate reaction was to blame the ground, and I hope that holds, because mm. you know, there's this sort of folk theory, isn't there, that, that I run an alto against Cerny Ascot put him off being adventurous. Unfortunately, that was mentioned, wasn't it? Um, but hopefully, this isn't the case with this one. Hopefully, Shishkin comes back. because yeah. not apart from anything else, Shishkin. We're going to talk about the Thursday in a bit, but Shishkin probably is the best chaser in training on that Ascot run. But we need to get him, hopefully get him back to his best. I doubt we'll see him again this season, is that right? Well, they are talking about going to entry potentially over two mile four, aren't they? But it uh, was mentioned, yeah. yeah. It'd be great to watch him yeah. entry. Um, well, he's hardly had a race, is he? So well, yeah. I don't know. But OK, Pat, let's come to you. Uh, Shishkin, looks like if anything, he's going up in trip. Could he just be one for the King George? We always talk about it this time, this after Cheltenham, don't we? Look at these horses that could be running the King George. Hardly ever happens. Yeah. Yeah, we tend to say as we're a lot of Nicky Henderson two miles, don't we? We were dying for Altior to move up, weren't we? Yeah, we just hope all's well with Shiskin and uh, see what happens. Oh, the one thing I was surprised about, if, if there was a surprise to me about the champion chase, it was in Nergum. I think we were all expecting him to blaze along in front and coming to the first, he was held up in, in last place. So they got the tactics uh, spot on there. It's very interesting. He's very good in Erga name, isn't he? But uh, how good he is? Is he one of the best ever? Probably not, but uh, he's the best around at the moment, that's for sure. Yeah, we're on the clock a bit, so we won't mention the booing of Tiger Roll, who <laughs> ran an absolute sledger, didn't he? And Delta worked in the gamble and all that sort of stuff. But it was only at Cheltenham, right? And I guess if the sun was shining, it probably wouldn't have happened. But um, it sort of culminated the day. Can we talk about the bumper? Because everyone, like the, the young uns love the bumper. <coughs> you know, uh, kills may not, but it was billed as a two horse race about on the figures going into it, and that's how it paid out. It is, yeah. I there's a lot of horses in there that are going to make really, really good jumpers. Nice. It looked a properly strong renewal. Every, it seemed like every week in Ireland, there was you, you, the horse would come out, you'd just think, oh, that got a chance in the bumper, and then you realise it's £10 short of the best ones that you've seen so far. Um, for Sil Vega, 141, level with the likes of Fernie Hollow, who is obviously supremely talented, if a little bit fragile. Um, you know, you think the first two, the third as well, is he, a really good sort of physically. I think the first three particularly are all going to be 
proper novice hurdlers for sure. Okay, that's what everyone wants to hear. Everyone wants to find the Fernie Olo, the you know the Segur heart and things like that. Is, is it something that you hope? For? I mean, Pat's got an eye catcher. We'll get to in a minute. But what do you make of it? Um, yeah, they're eighteen months from being interesting to me. These horses, <laughs> but uh, no, fast of it was really really impressive, yeah. uh, and he's going to be. He's going to be a story horse forever, isn't he? Yeah. Well, they don't yeah. often, these wonder mares, and I'm talking top notches, like honeysuckle, it does not often cast in stone that they produce Istabrax, is it? It's, it's into a different realm, isn't it? Because you've got, you know, Franco's dam wouldn't have been a superstar, but she produced loads of good horses, and she was a 110 and you've horse. Got, and you've got Urban you know, Sea, of course, who does Urban, do it. Well, Urban Sea's so. the one exception, but what you've got, once they go into the new realm where it's breeding, yeah. it shouldn't translate directly, but the, the best broodmares were either extremely well-bred or good horses without necessarily yeah. being There is a bit class. of a theory that you'll probably hear about in the next couple of weeks, yeah. I imagine, that we'll concentrate on, that they're racing more now, these mares as well, so there's a bit more of a chance of it happening, So because the programme's been tweaked and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Pat, Fasal Vega, I guess we're looking at the next supreme favourite, are we? I would say so, yes, and uh, he. I spoke to Patrick uh, yesterday, and he's going to go to Punchestown, and it's been done before the double, so he's all mm. systems go there. I actually, I did ask Patrick, was there any horse that they've had run so far this week that surprised them with how well it's run? And he said to me, the horse that finished four, Seabank Bistro, really, really surprised them just how well he was. He's fourth. He's only beaten about eight lengths. They weren't expecting him to be that good so soon. And he said that, that that's the one that, uh, as, as well as Vasil Vega, he'd be very, very interested in that horse next season. So uh, that's one for your notebook. And I think he won a trip. Love that. All right. And a horse to follow from the bumper as well. That's the good old Queen Monday done. Let's go to Kempton, shall we? Everyone loves a bit of jumping around Kempton. And the 3.15 is a race we're keen to look at with you, Pat Cooney. Yeah, favourite Espoir de Guiche. And that's the uh, the mighty combination of Venetia Williams and Charlie Joyce. They had a great run so far this week. He's favourite. He's a popular horse. He won last time out. That was his first run since a wind up. That being said, we're at Kempton. You know, we always go word association. You talk to the heavy Kempton good. But it's good at Kempton on uh, Saturday. And then there's a lot of heavy ground form uh, in his makeup. So that would be a slight concern, maybe. But he comes on the back of a good run. And you look at some of his rivals. Well, oh, they all pulled up last time out. Pistol whipped, killer clown and up the straight. But I'm going to give up the straight another go here because he's best fresh. He's got good ground uh, form round at this track. And he hasn't run for 70 days, so that will freshen him up. He's bottom weight, Tom Cannon aboard, Richard Rowe. I could make a case out for him, but there's no denying. If the word soft had appeared in the going description, this favourite would be a lot, lot shorter. Yeah, I could, this is going to be drifting a bit, I think, for me, uh, despite so. the fact it's that firm. Uh, there's a couple in here. If you don't mind, I'm going to have a little stab at this. I love Native Robin. He, but he's Mr. Wing Canton, <laughs> isn't he? But I love him. He is. In, he's, he's a reformed character. I've thoroughly used, enjoyed analysing him this he used season. To be, he used to, be a, used to be a horse that you would not fancy in a scrap. Yeah. And he is now. He's, he's out battled horses like <clears throat> Flagrant Del Tiet yeah. and horses, you know, horses that are really quite progressive. He's going to go from the front again, isn't he? Yeah, you'd have to assume so. Yeah. Uh, well, the thing is, he might go from the front, but I would also imagine De Becci would go uh, from the front as well. Are you giving this another chance? No, because I think he's he's uh, he needs. You're laughing because he was. It's all he was talking about a couple of months ago, wasn't it? I found the best handicap to. Yeah, he got, a, got a, he got an absolutely horrible ride in the uh, sky bet. I thought, but he <laughs> might actually not be a three miler. He's so exuberant. He might need. I said to off air when he ran at Newcastle last time behind Do Your Job. He ran through that race like the Topham winner. He pinged everything. Ooh. Went really, and I thought oh, they'll run him in the top of him now. So I'm slightly surprised to see him here. Mm. Um, I think he's a he's not an easy ride. I'd be, um, you know, I'd be happier if it was Harry Skelton on because he's a difficult ride this horse. Yeah. Um, so okay. I w I'm just slightly off that idea. This part of me, I agree with the soft ground stuff. Before he won that race at Warwick, all his form was in Ascot in midwinter, and Ascot in midwinter can get really deep. So it's a spe he, his ground is really much yeah. on, on the soft ground. The horse I've put up, I'm gonna. You know, you're not you're not around 15 minutes. I am going to put up a Tim Sider horse that ran badly last time again. Killer Clown was really progressive before he ran in the uh, in that race by Phoenix. The Way. Cider double, yeah, Cider double. Get it poured, poured <laughs> on, man. Cider with Rosie. Yeah, uh, I've never not have ever been called that. Let's hope it's a rosy ending for you with Killer Clown, of course. Uh, so, yeah, was... not, and so he's run when he ran up in Canton. He he smashed up uh, Slate House, who ran a very good race actually. In yeah, the play, he did. Uh, yeah, Cheltenham on Thursday. Um, he just looked like he was a miss at Ascot in, in the deep ground behind Phoenix Way. That was a warm enough race anyway. This wouldn't be as strong. And yeah, it's, it's, if you chuck out that run, which I think you can reasonably do, and he's been given enough time to get over it, 
he's still a far more interesting horse than 10 to 1 implies for this race. It'd be interesting to see what the market does with Pistol Wit. Uh, he's obviously dropping class, they had him entered at Cheltenham. In fact, he was, he, he was a non, wasn't he? He was a scratching, I think. Was it the plate he was scratched from? He might have been. Yes, I think he was. Yeah, yeah. okay. Th they are waiting for this horse to, you know, sort of get his big Saturday race. He's got a lot of weight, isn't he? What, whatever he's, 152 sticky, isn't it? But the other horse that interests me in the market will be uh, our old friend, uh, Diego de Charmil, who, who, when Nichols preps his horses, he goes to win Canton a couple mm. of weeks before. And this guy always works, he tells me, like a group one horse on that day. And <laughs> apparently he's pulled up some trees again. He's got his ground and it will be disappointing. And you know how the rhetoric goes. Sod's Law is the biggest thing in racing, isn't it? Nichols, we, we are filming before Gold Cup Day. He might have had a treble, for all we know, at this point. Well, do, I don't think, has he got three honours? I'm not sure. <laughs> but Bob and Go is a massive fancy in, in, in the hunting chase, isn't it? But <laughs> it's always this day when the trainers that have had a stinker during Cheltenham, you seem to get the microphones in their faces <laughs> on the Saturday, don't they? And this will be Paul Sod's Law. I'm going for Diego, Matt. Yeah, I'm with Keith on, on Killer Clown, actually. Um, I was properly impressed with him at Wincant, and he mentioned the stole, um, uh, Slate House Stolen Silver ran a well at Cheltenham as well. Uh, he was mm. fourth, I think. Yes, he was. Um, I, I think that two-week turnaround before Ascot, I think that was probably just a bit too a bit too quick for him. Yeah. Uh, bit of a break since, get back to that sort of form, I, I think he's too big a price for sure. All right, OK, there you go. 3 3 at Kempton, Gordon Ramsay style, done. Let's go back to our Cheltenham review then. Thoroughly enjoying this with some of the greatest minds in the game. And, oh, Lord almighty, would it have been one of the greatest novice chase performances we'd seen from Galloping de Champ had he not slipped on landing after the last in the turn or something? Come on. <laughs> what a horrible way to finish that race. We were spending it together that we were, on the live show and you turned around and went, I wouldn't want to be handicapping that race. I'll be honest, I panicked a bit <laughs> when he went yeah, there. Nice. Um, it, it, it is tricky, but you know you, you can you can use what you've got. Um, you know you can you can time horses. You look at between the two out and the last Gallop and Deschamps doubled the margin to Bob Ollinger. I I think he'd have won by maybe half that again. So you look, you're talking maybe 15 lengths conservatively. Obviously Bob Ollinger was he wasn't himself, was he? Um, I'm not convinced that he's a chaser. I don't think his jumping's good enough. Um, he looked a little bit awkward as well, didn't he? But I think we were on the way to seeing something special from Galapan de Champ. Um, we've rated a 175, um, which is, you know, one of the best novices, novice performances of the last, well, in recent times. Um, what were the likes of Altior as a novice? High 160s, borderline wow, 170. We we're, we're talking Vitor was 175 in this race. Well, we spoke uh, to you when you made your debut on the show about where the 163 came from uh, at Leopardstown on his debut. And you, fair play, man. You've got it right. Yeah, that was. I think that was the best Chase debut performance of All recent time. time. Yeah, yeah, definitely the, yeah. the modern era. Um, what are we looking at then here? Because I mean, it was an interesting performance. Come to Pat in a minute because he ballooned a couple early, then he was deadly, and then you're turning in. You're like, oh, here we go, mm. and he jumped it perfectly fine, didn't he? So Mullins talks, plays with the head, doesn't he? In typical Willie style, you're like, come on, stop it, Willie. Can't go champion Chase. A bit of a dead cat, wasn't it? No, because that the way he jumped. The, I mean, yes, he's still an inexperienced chaser, but the way he jumped those first two fences, he'd be ten lengths behind in a championship. Well, chase. maybe you know he was going. It was slow and big, but you know after that, perfectly acceptable and jumped as well as anything within a champion chase. But it's uh, what you do with him. I when the dust settles, I want to get the old stopwatch out again and just put that up against Alaho. I don't see. imagine there's any dust on that stopwatch. <laughs> <laughs> it's usually red hot. I would imagine no, gleaming. I, I just I use it with my eyes. I haven't told me and what my eyes told me yesterday was that Bob Ollinger did not turn up at all. As soon as he hit four out, yeah. the head went in the air. And whether he disliked the ground, whether there was something, whether he hurt himself, I don't know. But I found it very difficult to then put a quantitative idea of what Gallup and Deschamps was doing. Mm. So I'm now relying on what he did up to against Alaho an hour and a half later myself. I, I mean, with a view to next season, I'd love to see a big matchup between Alaho and, and Gallup and Deschamps. <laughs> Can you imagine? But, but like... We mentioned earlier, good horses need other good horses. Alaho is probably the best jumper in training. Well, let's come to you in a second, Matt, on that. Let's bring Pat in, because if you're on the galloping Alaho double, which half the track was, commiserations, <coughs> and if you're on the Bob and Alaho double, happy days! You've got to jump up to win them, haven't you, Pat? Well, that was it. Certainly from an anti-post point of view, Bob Ollinger was always going to go for this race. We never quite knew what Galloping was going to go for. So, uh, yeah, both were as bad as each other in, in that respect. But as, as for Galloping... How how'd you get a proper handle on him? Because that wasn't the real Bob Ollinger that day. But one one thing I know is he looked a superstar at Leopardstown that day. 
And I, I just think, well, could you not run him in the King George on Boxing Day? That, that could be the race for the ages if we get him, Brave Man's Game and all the other superstars on the show. Uh, but of course, it's Willie Mullins. He's going to be entered in everything in the world. Uh, the champion chase is an interesting angle, isn't it? But um, yeah, he's a wonderful horse. Pleased to see he's OK after the race. And uh, it was an amazing experience being there. It was just a look of disbelief with everybody. And um, yeah, a funny feeling being there, that was for sure. Must have been extremely low to be Paul Townend after that in particular. And Willie was like, you could see the wind had been taken out of the cells. But then, of course, well, yeah. along comes Alaho. And what I loved about what Paul Townend did, yes, he, with the gallop of the Champs, he saw a stride, he threw him out. The horse jumped it really well and then stumbled on landing. So absolutely no fault of Townend's there. But you can forgive why he might be beating himself up about it. Then he comes oh, with man. Alaho. And he's got the same situation again. And most <laughs> most people, I, if it was me, I can tell you, I guarantee you, I'd have got Alaho to pop it. You'd have done the Charlie Post. I'd have got, I'd you'd have stopped, <laughs> gone over it, and off you go. Yeah, yeah. Was, but yeah, so I'd have been, come on, just to get him to pop that last fence. He saw a stride again, and he went for it. Alaho put down on him, sod's law. Oh, but, um, it was a heart in my, in my It was, it was a yeah. bet. Although he, the horse is such a bull that I don't think, I don't think a steel wall, a, a concrete wall would stop him. Yeah. It's just uh, a, a machine. But um, Willie afterwards said last year it was an awesome performance match. This year it was a very good performance. I mean, I, again, we were lucky enough to spend it together watching the other. I said after a fence, didn't I? Which caused a bit of a bit of controversy. I said, I, this I'm, is all over. Yeah, I was of. I was quite. I saw exactly where you were coming from. There are races where you can go that far out. This horse is enjoying it. Yeah, that's going to happen. Is Willie right? Last year's slightly better than this year's. <laughs> Bang up there. They're, they're the same. I think he's one seven eight last year. One seven eight. One seven nine this year. Okay. Um, one I, day you'll give him a one eighty. <laughs> he one probably. Day. Why hasn't he got one eighty yet? Well, I, I think his style is that very much the sort of horse that's going to get that one day, isn't it? I think he yesterday. I'm not sure it was that strong. Chamblee obviously didn't run his race. Um, you know, looking at Janadil, who's like a mid one sixties horse finishing. Well, he has been. Yeah, I, I I thought Janadil was. Well, as we said beforehand, I thought he was each bit better because he still you did has, the spotlights. Give credit where it's due. You put up the forecast there if you were reading him. Yeah, and he's, he just looks like a horse that still had a bit of untapped potential. I thought so, but again, yeah. Eduardo Allen was third, wasn't he? Only beaten half a length or so by Janadil. Uh, yeah. And he's never going to be more than a mid-160s horse, is he? Yeah, exactly. And I think that, that to an extent, it holds it down a little bit. But we're still talking about a proper horse. And I just mentioned earlier, that, that, that match-up we might get between him and, and Galapan, you know, that they could really draw massive performances out of each other. Yeah, Pat, were there any quotes coming for the King George with Alaho? Here we go again. Yeah, I think most people tend to think that maybe that's the wrong way round for him. I think that's been mooted before. Um, but I suppose it'll be all systems go for the Ryanair. He would probably win it by a mile again next year, won't he? Yeah, he's a magnificent horse. Well, let's go to stay hurdle because another magnificent horse that turned up. Lots of people were worried about his constitution with a crowd. Florian Porter, not a bit of a it. A lot was made of that, wasn't there? A hell of a lot, yeah. We, yeah, speaking to some really good judges I and mean, jockeys and the industry festivals. Oh, he, the last time he saw a crowd at Punchstown, he you know, was a yoke. You know, he wouldn't so. be in the top five nutcases in that race. But he, he, could, he looked anything but, didn't he? And this is a freak of a horse. We know this. Let's get through this quickly because it's... But he, he he jumped like a lion, didn't he? And what where was he comparatively to last year? Uh, he was a little bit below, actually, about mm. four pounds below, three pounds below last year, four pounds below his peak. Um, Despite the fact that Paisley, previous winner, and Champ were there. And... Well, this is the thing. With the, the, it was the ride of the week, I thought, from Danny Martin. Oh, absolutely. What a magnificent yeah. ride that was. He absolutely took the took the mickey out Slowed of Slowed it, went oh, again. just dictated him. He just, I've never seen anybody do that in a championship race before. But the flip side of that is... When that sort of thing happens, you can't run big figures. No. Because you stack the field up. And Time Hill and Paisley Park, who are these days mid 160s horses? He ran a belt at Paisley, didn't yeah. he? They are finishing, so good they're finishing three back. lengths off you. I mean, you're looking at the sixth and seventh, uh, a, a mid 150s horses at best. And they're, mm. they're beating. 10 lengths or so, wasn't it? Not even that. Really? Yeah. So they're, they're, they're pretty, it's pretty bunchy. And that, that makes it hard to run a big figure. But, you know, Florian Porto at his best to win well, not too long ago to be talking those high 160s figures. You know, he's a. Probably is the best day in Hurdler around, isn't he? You have to look at that and go, he's, he's value for it. He's 169's his peak, isn't it? 169, yeah. And I'd see, you have to see his value for that. Yeah, you? I'd Next say time so, he yeah. runs, he'll, he'll, be off one, he'll be 169 yeah, on, yeah. on the RPR's yeah. book. And like the rest of us, he absolutely loves Cheltenham. That is our review then of the three days up to this week's What a Shout. Fly on the wall stuff. It's like exactly what it's like here at the Racing Post. Hope you enjoyed it. Feature race on the Saturday, and it's a great puzzle. It's a celebration of what a great week it's been. It's the Midlands National. Brilliant form last year. Before we go to someone who we're about to blow smoke up, Pat, what price is time to get up in his repeat bid? Well, he's currently around about nine to two with us. And of course, he is only four pound higher when, uh, than when he won this race a year ago. 
Who did he beat? Well, he beat Mighty Thunder, who went on to win a Scottish National. So the form's there. I was actually surprised to see him only on 10 stone nine in this race. So I'd definitely have him down as a well-handicapped horse, but he's clearly had his problems so far this season. So where how he'll go in the market remains to be seen. The ground is going to be uh, testing, maybe not as testing as uh, it normally is for you, Toxeter. The version that won this race last year is a worthy favourite, but you've got to draw a line through his two runs this year. So I don't know. It's, it's, it's very interesting to see how we'll go in the market. Um, I'm scratching around trying to find one at a price. I've actually ended up right on the bottom, number 19, Supreme Escape. Not normally my style, this £10 out the handicap, but got a, a good jockey on Joe Anderson claiming seven and came back to form last time out. And we've got Evan Williams, who seems to do very well on Saturdays in handicaps. Um, so maybe that one. But the key to the race is it's all about time to get up. So uh, how his well-being is will dictate how he goes in the market. Well, let's see, because look, this time last year, I think the only reason why anyone watched this show was because your line at the top of it was in absolute certainty or something. Well, it was your, one of your bets of the week. It was one of the I thought time to get up. In fact, he was one of my bets at the festival. I thought he'd run in the Kim Muir. Ah, that's it. Um, but it, because McManus couldn't be there, I think he was less fussed about having winners. Okay. Uh, so he ran him in the Wood Midlands National instead. And I said, well, if he's in this race, I, I, I fancied him for the Kim Muir. He was 1-3-8, one, he's 1-4-2 one, now, isn't he? Yep. Uh, and there's two runs since. Pat said, you've got to forgive them. I can do that pretty yeah, easily. Same. One of them was the yep. Grand Sefton, you know, National Fences. They said he didn't like the National Fences. I'm not so sure about that. He just, yeah, he just looked run off his feet from an early stage. And then at Haydock, he... The, he drifted like nothing on earth. Uh, he was eight of one in the morning. Went off twenty two to one. Plainly wasn't really fit for that race, but he travelled as well as anything. So why is he running here? And try and be succinct about this <laughs> because there's been a lot said about it, hasn't Look, there? Look, it's a toss up. I don't know which it is, but either they genuinely couldn't get him qualified for the, get that sixth run in to get him qualified for the Grand National, or they just forgot you had to run six times. It's hard to know with this lot, man. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's, true, it's yeah. hard to know. Yeah, I don't think it matters for this race though because they've had four weeks since Haydock and yeah. they've gone right. Well, we can't get an entry now. Yeah. Why don't we just go back to Utoxeter and win that again? And you remember everyone's quoting him as the national favourite for this year. It yeah. could well be the case going into next year's winter because they're going to need to want to get up a little bit, aren't they? A little they? bit, but he'll win this race to go up to that because not only did he beat Mighty Thunder last year, yeah. it was actually quite a steadily run race and he came from off the pace. He looked. He took ages to land the gamble, didn't he? Yeah, he did because they basically crawled most of the way around. Okay. It wasn't very testing great. It was good to soft last year. Yeah. Didn't go that quick and it was quite a bunched finish. You know, the, the seventh was beaten seven and a half lengths. In the Midlands National, the second's usually beaten more than that. Uh, seventh, seventh hasn't finished. Yeah, right. Uh, it's, it's, so it wasn't the sort of what Midlands National were used to. Yeah. Screaming Colours was fourth. Highland Hunter was fifth, who ran a great race in the Welsh National to finish second. Yeah, Nicholas Akili was second, was sixth, and r keeps running good races in these marathon staying chases. Time to get up, won that race, and was valued for much, much more than the winning margin. If he'd been running in that race off 142, what price would he be? He'd be three to one still. Yeah. Uh, the cheap pieces go on. I thought he shaped really well at Haydock. I just think he'll win it again. I can remember waking up with a mild hangover on this day last year, on, on the Saturday, going, he's five to two. And then he drifted out a bit. Where are you sitting with him? It's hard. To, I find it hard not to sip him, if I'm honest. No, I, I completely agree. I think just everything's there for him, isn't it? Um, I, I definitely think he's the most likely winner of the race. Um, at a price, if there's one in there for me, it'd be the young warrior having his 10th start, I think it is here. He's about 20 to one. Um, he's a novice, won his first two starts over fences. Okay. Um, beating at Exeter last time, cheap pieces go on here. I just think he's crying out for a stamina test. Um, his jumping will need to improve. Might help for their gear a little bit, but um, you know, if, you, if you're looking for one at a price, maybe each way, I think he's, yeah, he could, he could run, outrun that sort of price. Oh, other interesting horses at price. Mamela's quite interesting. Harry Fry, obviously mm -hmm. love him, but took out the Mamela's race for him. It, I'll be keeping an eye on her just for Snow Leopardess, who is, I'm getting Are you all over her for the National? I'm very excited about the National. She's got a great ride in the beach, But how well yeah. did she jump? But oh, we digress. Really well, yeah. A form boost, please, of sorts, from Mamela for Snow Leopardess. But don't you dare go beating time to get up. We can win a time then. Who's it going to be? Dave Orton go first then. Three o'clock, hurdle race, Beauport. Surely, surely, this is his day in the sun. I know loads of these horses in this race, and he's a traveller, and he keeps bumping into something ridiculously well handicapped. This will be one for Tristan Davis. Keith Norrows. Yeah, time to get up again. If he was running in last year's race, the Midlands National of 142, I'd have still backed him. And he's 5-1 to one this year. Um, just has everything in his favour, I think. Lightning striking twice. I like it. Matt Gardner. Uh, yeah, young ball, 225 you talk, so It's a good novices handicap chase. I think he's the outsider of the field, or at least he was earlier. I've but he shouldn't be anywhere near that on form. Um, and, and promise as well. So, yeah, young ball for me. If you're coming into this show late and wondering why the price has crashed, Matt's put up a rather good case for it. Yeah. Here you go. There's your racker then. The weekend winners on Midlands National Day.
Well, sadly, that's all we've got time for then on this sort of Cheltenham edition, Midlands National Edition, whatever you want to call it. What a shout. Keith, great to have you down this week. You're a skier man. Yes, I am. With a few, with a few uh, schnapps in the bank after time to get up, Scotty. I don't have, they don't have schnapps in France. Do you sledge when you go? I, I can't <laughs> ski. I only sledge. They take it very seriously. I put helmets on and everything. Yeah, no, I don't. Well, I might do sledging this year. We're taking the kids. They'll be doing a bit more sledging than skiing. Yeah, you deserve it, man. Have a great one, Matt. Great to have you coming down and getting a real knee shot and these water shells. But thanks for you know pruning the form, as I said. Yeah, yeah. We've got plenty of good stuff. Hopefully some more good stuff this afternoon with the Gold Cup and uh, yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah, cheers, Matt. The gardener back with us. As was Pat Cooney. <laughs> You've been enjoying some week. You've still got Gold Cup Day to go. We will, of course, be looking back at the Gold Cup Day for you next week. And don't believe it, Pat. It's Lincoln time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, just have to go on a refresher course, look at these anti-post prices for the classics and say, no, never heard of it, never heard of it, never heard of it. So I have to go back to school for a week, I think. <laughs> yeah, Tom Seagal's already put up the Haggis Oz and I'm sure he's going to go on fab. <laughs> looking forward to that and looking forward to having you back with us as well. What a pleasure it's been to have you with us all week in this studio. Do, of course, like and subscribe. They're flying through the roof. Do, of course, download that free Must Have Racing Post app if you've not done so yet. It's on the Google Play Store or the App Store itself. From myself, Dave Orson, gamble responsibly this weekend and enjoy that sport.